Um, well, thank you all for, you know, coming back repeatedly. <laughs> um, so I'm excited today because there's a bunch of things, a bunch of cool facts about Apollonian circle packing that, that we're going to see. Um, so we talked about the Apollonian group. If you remember, it was given in terms of swaps. And then the super Apollonian group, you can add some inversions. And so those Apollonian circle packings um, aren't in any position in the plane when you describe it that way. Um, now I want to give uh, another version of the Apollonian group, which puts them into the plane. So um, sometimes people call this the geometric Apollonian group. And the idea is that we can use Mobius transformations. So this um, I might write like this, and it lives inside um, PSL to, uh, well, actually, turns out it lives inside PSL to Z adjoin I, um, together with, if you like, uh, complex conjugation. So sometimes people call that like generalized Mobius transformations or something like that, if you add complex conjugation. And the idea here is that if you take the geometric Apollonian group and you apply it, to the sort of fundamental Descartes quadruple, kind of the simplest Descartes quadruple that you could um, write down in the plane might be this one, where two of the circles are lines. And, uh, and then I've marked 0, 1, and i, so that's sitting inside the complex plane. And the idea is that what characterizes this group is that this will take that fundamental quadruple to the whole strip packing. And then if you want some other Mobius, uh, sorry, some other Apollonian circle packing, you apply a Mobius transformation, and you can get your favorite Apollonian circle packing, whichever one you might be interested in. And you can, you can do that by taking three points, maybe three tangency points or something like that, and using those um, to, to move a particular quadruple of interest to the quadruple that will now generate an Apollonian packing elsewhere. And the fact that the Mobius transformation preserves all the necessary things means you still get a packing. Um, OK, and uh, so am I in the right? No, I'm in lecture two. I thought I would save myself time by writing down the. Uh, these things, but I think it took me longer to find them. <laughs> um, okay, so those are the those are the generators that you can use if you if you decide that you want um, to do this. So you can see I used complex conjugation to do this, um, and there's various ways. So I mean, you always have a little bit of wiggle room when you're defining these things, and I'm I'm being vague because I don't want to bother with it. But um, because you have a Descartes quadruple, uh, and you're looking at its image under a bunch of Mobius transformations, you may be repeating some of the circles. So you might decide you want the group which takes, you know, really just the real line to the whole strip packing or uses that Descartes quadruple and so does it's a slightly smaller group because you've got four circles to start with and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of variations on this. Um, this is just one that will work. Okay, so that makes this a Kleinian group. Um, and so then it's natural to ask, you think of the Kleinian groups as acting on the, um, the extended complex plane, which is the boundary of the upper half space, which is a model of hyperbolic three space. And so, you know, it's natural to ask from that perspective, if you're that kind of person, um, you know, what happens when we mod out by this? And so for those who are curious, this is infinite volume, but geometrically finite. So again, it's got this sort of in-between nature, um, not too big, not too small, in some sense. Okay, so, if we take a packing, uh, so this is just going to mean packing, that lives inside um, the complex plane like this, then we can talk about um, the residual set. And so what this means is if you take the union of the circles in the packing, and then you take the closure. Okay, so you've got this fractal that we've been drawing over and over again, um, but actually, you know, there's, um, you can close that and there's like extra points in there somewhere, right, that you, can't, that you can't really get a handle on. In the case where this is the strip packing, then this is literally just the limit set of this Apollonian group. 
So if you like to think um, of things that way. And then, of course, you can you know, take a Mobius transformation to get whichever other one you want. OK? And so McMullen um, has, I think, the best Hausdorff dimension computation. And so it's um, something like 1.30568 and so on. So you might wonder what the Hausdorff dimension is useful for in this context, but it's controlling sort of the, um, the growth of the, the fractal, right? And so in particular, um, if you want to understand how the number of um, uh, circles is growing, so if I make the following definition, I want to count the number of circles in the packing which have curvature below a given bound. So this is with multiplicity, okay? So I might see the same curvature repeatedly, particularly if we're in the integral case, right? And so we're just counting how many circles there are um, that are smaller than, or sorry, bigger than a certain size. Okay. And this will grow as some constant times x to the power alpha, where alpha is that Hausdorff dimension. So that's maybe the most important role it plays is that it's telling you about the growth of the packing. Okay. Any questions about all that? Yeah. This, for, like count the circles? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure if that would be efficient. I'm not sure. Does anybody know? I know there's some people who might know. He was asking about how to compute the Hausdorff dimension. Like whether you can actually use the growth of the circles to do it. It seems. And? <laughs> count the number of circles of curvature, take log, and then divide. It seems, it seems like the log would lose a lot of, yeah. yeah. OK, so, um, okay, so now I want to do um, the space of circles. And it, this is really, you know, this is going to be useful for the Apollonian circle packing. This is just something about circles, yeah? Yeah, sure. Of three. Um, are we like all the way through the order to be like complex Q bus using complex functions? Is that it? Okay, are we like closing out like into X above Q bus? Oh, you mean because I wrote generators that have conjugation in them? Is that what you mean? Um, well, okay, so you'll get a slightly different thing if you use these different variations of the um, geometric Apollonian group. And when I write this, I guess I'm thinking maybe of a version that doesn't have the complex conjugation in it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they give an error term, yeah. For this, um, what she's talking about here is this this growth. So this says asymptotic, but you can get an error term. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So the idea here is uh, this is just a, a tool that, that'll be useful for talking about the circles when they're sitting inside the complex plane, and the idea is um, to make a space where the points of the space are the circles of the complex plane. And so um, you can do this with Minkowski space. So what you do is take um, four variables, four real variables, and you know I don't know why they're b, b prime x, y. It's just that's what they are. Um, and then you write a quadratic form which is going to be of signature 3, 1. Okay. And then this gives you the same story that we had before. I can only draw it like a dimension down, right? Because now we're in four dimensions. 
but um, you know, there's a light cone, and then there's some hyperboloid that lives outside it, right? And some hyperboloids that live inside it, right? And this space out here, maybe we set Q equal to uh, one, this one sheeted hyperboloid, that's gonna be my space of circles, okay? And the fundamental fact that you get is that there's a map which I'll explain in a second, can take you from a point on here, which will take you to a circle in the complex plane, which is given by um, interpreting B as the curvature. So the curvature is B, and the curvature times the center as a complex number, is x plus i, y. Yeah? Yeah, you can include, yeah, exactly, yeah. You just have to figure out what the b, b prime, x, y coordinates ought to be for that case, right? And so then this will be a bijection um, between this sheet here and the circles, including the straight lines, the circles in the extended complex plane. Okay, so let me explain um, what the map actually is. Okay, that's the one drawback of this tablet is you can't keep as much stuff on the screen as you would like. <laughs> um, okay, maybe there's sort of enough room here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is take the cone down here. Now, everything's a dimension up, right? I'm drawing one dimension lower, so you know, forgive me for that. Then I've got the hyperboloid, and I'm starting with some point which is on that hyperboloid. And what that gives me is a perpendicular plane in, the, you know, in terms of the Minkowski um, uh, form. So the perpendicular plane is like, if I were to draw it, it's, it's sort of reflecting through the light cone. Um, so it looks, it's gonna cut the light cone something like this. So this is a plane, let's maybe call it P, it'll be a plane perpendicular to V, V is the normal. Okay. And then what that does is you've got your hyperboloid inside, which you're thinking of, now remember this is all off by a dimension, right? So this is the upper half space whose boundary will be um, the complex plane, right? So this maybe we'll call this like T minus, um, the whole thing, let me see, inside here is T minus, and then the boundary, maybe I'll call it delta T minus minus for because the form is negative there. Um, and so this thing is actually your extended complex plane, right? But I'm drawing a dimension lower. And then the idea is that what you do is you take this plane and it cuts the hyperboloid. Maybe I need another color in here, right? It's gonna cut this hyperboloid and in particular, it's gonna intersect the boundary which I've drawn as if it's finite, but of course it's off, <laughs> right? Um, but it's gonna give you um, a circle on that boundary. And because it's a lower dimensional picture, I'm getting two dots, right, as my circle, okay? So these two dots in red here are supposed to be my plane intersected with the boundary, and this should be actually one sphere, which is the circle that we want. Okay, so that's how it gives you the set of circles. Okay, any questions? So, um, so then we can compute from a Mobius transformation what circle you get. So if we take some Mobius transformation, let's see, alpha. And then we can take the Mobius transformation, and again, just kind of like with the Schmidt arrangements, um, I'm interested in using some sort of base, you know, base point, some sort of circle to start with. So I'm gonna always use, um, the extended real line, and ask what circle this Mobius transformation goes to, and that gives me a way of associating Mobius transformations with circles. And the one that we get, we can describe in terms of these curvature and center times curvature coordinates. And it becomes very nice in terms of the, I hope I didn't, uh, I hope I got this right. <laughs> yeah, this looks right. <laughs> I always, so somehow the first time I wrote down a Mobius transformation in Greek letters, I switched beta and gamma from what everyone else in the world would do. 
And I've had problems ever since that moment. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> it's like, it's just a minus sign. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this means we have like a way of concretely dealing with uh, an Apollonian circle packing sitting in the complex plane. We have coordinates that we can compute with and so on and so forth. So this makes everything um, more computable. All right. And so the next thing that I, um, the first thing that I want to do with this, the next thing I want to talk about is, is the role of quadratic forms inside the Apollonian circle packing. Um, so the sort of, the example for this would be to take the strip packing and, um, let's make that a little bit bigger. And if you think about, take the real line, which is living down here, um, and you just, like, you want to break down the structure of the Apollonian circle packing into pieces that you can manage. So one way to do that is to focus on one circle and ask for the things that are tangent to that one circle. And you'll recognize these as the Ford circles in the strip packing case. And we know that the Ford circles, this is all shrunk by a half under these coordinates here. So the Ford circles, when you see them inside the strip packing, the usual way, um, We'll end up having curvature two times q squared, but it's just a it's just a spurious factor. Okay. So um, I might ask, what is this collection of circles? Or more simply, I might just ask, what is the collection of curvatures that I'm getting? And you see in this example that the curvatures are all the squares. Okay. And you get something like this in general, which you might imagine because we've you know all of these um, uh, Apollonian circle packings, we're now putting them in the plane as Mobius um, images of one another. And so you can give a general theorem. And um, this was originally Graham, I guess I should write this out at least once here. There's a lot of authors. Graham, Ligarius, Mallows, Wilkes, and Jan. And then also um, part of this observation is due to Sarnak. So there's a, there's a series of papers by Graham, Ligarius, Mallows, Wilkes, and Jan at the beginning of the 2000s where they study all of the sort of interesting geometric properties of Apollonian circle packings and some of the number theoretic properties of Apollonian circle packings, and it kind of got um, people's interest started. Um, and, uh, and one of the first observations that you make is this observation about the circle's tangent to one sort of um, mother circle that you might be. Okay. So I'm interested in all those circles inside a particular packing tangent to C. So let's take C to be our circle. Uh, let's give it a curvature of N. Um, so this is C over here. And then there exists a primitive integral binary quadratic form. So two variables associated to C, whose discriminant will be minus four n squared, such that the curvatures tangent to C are exactly the values of this form minus the curvature. So each one of them is translated. So the translated values of a quadratic form. And I want the primitive values, which just means I'm plugging in x and y co-prime, okay? Because otherwise I get these extra multiples. Okay, so the strip packing here is an example of that. There's no translation in that case because the curvature is zero. So they really look like squares. Um, uh, but in general, you have a binary quadratic form um, translated by the curvature. And one way to do this proof um, is to use the geometric, uh, the geometric picture, the geometric um, um, Apollonian group. And the idea is that if you are interested in doing this for the forward circles, then, so here's zero, one, and i. This is tangent to the extended real line at infinity, right? So it's also one of the forward circles, that horizontal line there. And so we can take that circle, and then we can ask, what is the orbit that gives me the forward circles inside the Apollonian group? So maybe, um, remember, I'm associating the circles anywhere in the complex plane as images of the real line. So this is translation by i up one. So this is the 
this is, um, I don't know, what should I call the circle? D, just to have it in it, have a name, okay? And then it turns out that inside the uh, geometric Apollonian group, you have a copy of gamma two, which is um, the two congruence subgroup. Okay, so elements of um, SL2Z that are congruent to the identity mod two. And so it's most of SL2Z, really. You can just think of that as SL2Z for, for practical purposes. And then this is the collection of Mobius transformations that'll take you from the real line up to all of the Ford circles, to um, the Ford circles. Okay, so that's the collection of Ford circles in some sense, written as Mobius transformations. And then what you wanna do is you wanna do this more generally, so you move to your, um, your tangent family here. And to do that, you just have some Mobius transformation which is taking you to say some circle C prime there that you're interested in. Well, actually, maybe that's our circle C that we want in the theorem, so let's call it C. Okay, so it's gonna take the real line over to, to C, and that just gives you a coset here. Okay, so this is the collection of Mobius transformations, taking R hat to the family tangent to C. All right, so what that means is now we've got concretely, uh, we can write them down and we can just compute the curvatures. Um, so up here, we see how to write the curvature in terms of each Mobius transformation. And it's kind of an interesting computation to do yourself. You get a copy of the curvature of C, that's N, and then you also get basically the norm of x gamma plus y delta. So really what you have to do, right, is you have to write some general element of gamma two, and then you have to write this as some alpha beta gamma delta, and then you run this computation, and you see that you get the norms of some lattice. So remember, the lattice. I care about these lattices, and you can see the lattice happening right here. Yep. Yeah, sorry, norm of a complex number means the absolute value squared. I just don't want the square root in there. So um, yeah, so basically when we did that uh, bijection between binary quadratic forms and lattices, to go back from a lattice to the binary quadratic form, you're taking the norms of all the elements. It's the lengths of the lattice elements that is the quadratic form. We would take away that square root that we don't want. Right? So this is exactly the quadratic form that comes from um, this particular lattice in the plane. So that tells us that this lattice is important. So this lambda, which is gamma z plus delta z um, in terms of that Mobius transformation, that lattice is important somehow. And this is my binary quadratic form. Okay, so that's really a sketch. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I warrant the little square here because I didn't give you the details. <laughs> um, okay, questions? A little further? Yep, this here? A little bit further up. Oh, this uh, space of circles, yep. Sorry, can you just say a little louder? Mm hmm yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, it is a little weird, yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. Down here? Matrices in the standard way. So you don't mean in the Mobius transformation way.
Yeah, the Hermitian form whose zeros is the, yeah. that's what you're talking about. Yeah, if you take a Hermitian form, any circle can be described as the zero set of some Hermitian form. Um, uh, yeah, so this is, yeah. Um, the coordinates of that can be given in terms of the alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, but it's not, so what's the question about that? Not exactly, no. Yeah. There's a relationship. You can go back and forth. No. I think. The, I mean, about it not being exactly. Other questions? Okay. So, um, okay, so now I get to tell you uh, something pretty cool, which is now we've got these um, quadratic forms associated to basically choosing a circle inside the packing and looking at the family, right? And so let's look at the collection of such things. So as a sort of corollary to this, um, so again, Graham, Laguerre, Smiles, Wilkes, and Young, they thought about things this way. So you can look at quadruples um, as the first being that fixed sort of mother circle and then A, B, C, the other three being tangent to it. So we're really thinking of this as N, and then we've got some beginning of the family here. A, B, and C are telling us how to build out that family. Okay, so I'm thinking of the first position as having a special role. And if I want to think of it that way, if I want to sort of um, uh, just isolate that one circle and not care about how I'm generating the family, then what I could do is I could kind of mod out by the permutations of A, B, and C. So first of all, I don't care what order those guys are in. I just care about which one is, is N. And then um, I could also allow the swaps, S2, S3, and S4. So um, uh, so what I'm doing is I'm allowing A, B, and C to be swapped around. And that'll just give me another triple that generates the same family tangent to N, but it'll always preserve N. Okay. So this is really a way of thinking of sort of the set of um, circles inside a packing which they generate. So the packing isn't changing when I do those things. So it's not just about the circle, it's about the circle and the packing it lives in, but just the packing, not particularly which, you know, those other three circles are no longer um, important. Okay. Um, okay, so those are quadruples. And now what we've seen is that, you know, modding out by this, thinking about a mother circle and the things tangent to it, what we get are binary quadratic forms. So these look like, you know, for some coefficients, they look like this. The discriminant is negative four times n squared. Um, a and c uh, are positive. That makes it so that uh, you have a positive definite quadratic form. And over here, um, Actually, what I, if I only care about what is this family of circles and their values, then I, don't, I want to allow change of variables on the quadratic form side. Because choosing my ABC to, to sort of start off the form is really choosing my variables. So I want over here to mod out like I did yesterday. The only thing is, what you actually want to do is a slight um, trick to it. Here we really want PGL2 instead of PSL2, okay? It's not a big difference, so just forgive me for that. That's really the right thing to do. And then the map will, is this map from the proposition. And you can actually write out the coordinates in terms of n, a, b, c. So it's a very nice, explicit quadratic form. OK, so we get that exact quadratic form. Um, OK, so this is what this information means, but now we've taken it over to quadratic forms, which means, really, I'm living in the upper half uh, plane. But I'm going to mod out by PGL instead of PSL. Okay, so that just means that in terms of my fundamental domain here, um, I'm going to take half of it instead of the full fundamental domain. It's not a big difference. Okay, so what does this mean? What this means is that the space of, of circles living in packings is exactly the upper half plane, um, which means that we could start thinking of the upper half plane as the parameter space for Apollonian circle packings. 
at least with one circle um, identified. Yeah. Why? The, so any point in the upper half plane will give me a quadratic form, and then that will give me a quadruple. So not integral. Not integral. No, this is an R4. That's an important point. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm thinking of this. This is the geometric space of Apollonian circle packings. I'm not a number theorist right now. Yeah, I didn't say integral over here. So when you do, um, yeah, I did say integral up here uh, because, yeah, I should have, okay. So when Graham, Laguerre, Smiles, Wilkes, and Jan did this, they did it for the integral forms. But it, the general R fact is also true. And putting it in the bigger context is actually kind of nice. Yeah. Questions? So let's look at the space. So this is one of the cool things that I wanted to show you. So you've got a parameter space. And then what you want to do is you want to color it in some way to like highlight what happens at different places, right? So we're, we're just working with um, real curvatures here. I'm not interested in the number theory at the moment. So what kinds of different things can happen to Apollonian circle packings? And there are actually um, more, there's sort of more variety than I've hinted at um, before, which is that you can, have, um, you can have these bounded packings, which is all the pictures that I've been drawing here. We did see the strip packing, which is a sort of special case where two of the circles are curvature zero. But you can also have um, half plane packings where one of the curvatures is zero and the other um, circles actually keep getting bigger and bigger and fill the whole upper half plane. This can't happen with integer curvatures for obvious reasons, but, um, but it can happen geometrically. And then you can have a full plane packing and these are kind of hard to draw because um, they fill the whole plane, and you, so you can draw one little crack or something at a time, right? And um, these circles are just getting bigger and bigger and filling the entire plane. So geometrically, these are the things that can happen. And so what you might want to do is draw the, um, the upper half plane as the parameter space for Apollonian circle packings and see where these different ones occur, right? To try to understand what's going on. So, um, so here I'll draw kind of what it looks like. So this is the real line, and this is the upper half plane. Um, there is a line up here above which it's bounded. Yep. Just, sorry, yeah, go ahead. So in your whole discussion, it was just circle 15 and half plane. Yep. It allowed you to get these quadratic forms, and so now you're just talking about sort of this impossible experience. So what I'm doing is, yeah, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take a point in the upper half plane, interpret it as a pair of CP, forget C, and ask about what shape P has. So each, each point in the upper half plane gives me a circle generating a packing, but I'm just curious, does it generate bounded? Does it generate unbounded? C varies. C varies, yeah. Yeah. So you see the same packing repeatedly in the upper half plane with different choices of C. So the half plane packing in this picture here is it has a curvature zero circle. So this is actually the lower half there is going to be all inside one single circle. And in the full plane packing, there's nothing of curvature zero. That's all. So full plane, you're going to get larger and larger circles. So curvatures are going to accumulate at zero. Or, or not the full plane, but the disk to the, take any more recent and take the disk to the yeah. other and the whole thing minus the CD, and you'll take the image of the most of the bounded half plane and you'll get the full plane. Yeah, that could work, yeah. Okay. So in the half plane you could get the I know, they're kind of hard to imagine, right? Because the circle's just, like, what you really need is a video, I should make this, where you zoom out, and it just continues to, like, bigger and bigger circles keep coming in from the outside, right? Like, that's what, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're all Mobius images of each other, so yeah, exactly. They're not different, yeah, exactly. This is really something which, 
yeah, exactly. You've, you've chosen your point at infinity. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and that sort of foreshadows what's going to happen, actually. So. I think they all have the same Hausdorff dimension. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the two on the right here can't occur with integer curvatures because the curvatures are approaching zero and there aren't integers approaching zero. Very fundamental fact, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to draw this for you. This is, a, this is exciting. So, um, so what I want to do is I want to break up the upper half plane, so this is my upper half plane here, into regions according to what kind of packing you see, bounded, strip, half plane, or full plane. So above a certain line, you get bounded. Um, so actually, this line occurs at height i, so I might as well label for you some of the positions in the upper half plane. Um, you also get bounded in here, you also get bounded in here, you also get bounded <laughs> in here. <laughs> and so it's amazing, it turns out that the parameter space itself is an Apollonian circle packing. So um, where is it here? Yeah. Which one is it? Did I not put the, oh shoot, I forgot the, to put the picture over here. Anyway, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess, I guess from right, what, I, what I see here is you're probably going to put a bounded right above there and in that, in that space between the two big bounded balls, right? Mm -hmm. And does that mean Oops. that the other three cases are less likely to happen with the, with the this much like spatial thing? Um, yeah, kind of. Yeah, right. So bounded is sort of the most generic case. So what happens is the bounded is the, so let's let uh, P be the strip packing inside H, so inside my parameter space. Yeah, Rich? Okay, and then the bounded ones are the interiors of the circles. And then the, um, the tangency points of P, oh sorry, I'm like not being parallel here. The tangency points of P, can you guess which packing that is? That's the strip packing. And then the circles without the tangency points, that's the half plane. And then the rest which is to say like the limit stuff, you know, um, minus the circles themselves. That's um, the full plane stuff. So all that like little dust that's left over, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to talk about what Mary was saying before. So, so if you start with the strip packing, I mean, the cheaper thing you could do, maybe you could just forget it, but you just take a point and you have a half plane. So you say, well, I'm just going to move this point to infinity, and that's my new half plane. Yep. And if you happen to take a point that says tangency or a yep. you're going to yep. exactly the classification. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly why this is the, the way it works. Yeah, this is not like a, this is not a deep fact, but it's wonderful to watch it happen. Yeah. So it's That's right, yeah, you, what you have is, it's a circle, comma, a packing, and it's the geometric info, so it's just up to affine transformations. It doesn't matter where in the plane it is or, or how it's rotated. I'm just interested in the shape. Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so this is, this is sort of a breaking point. I'm going to tell you about the number theory now, but if there's any more questions about all the geometric stuff. Okay. Okay, so yeah, let me tell you some number theory. So now we're going back only to the bounded packings because um, uh, we want to have integer curvatures. And so, um, so the question is what are the curvatures with multiplicity or without multiplicity, but we start kind of asking this question without multiplicity, okay, of an integral, a primitive integral um, Apollonian circle packing. So that's our fundamental question. And the first thing that you observe, um, oh, you know, I should have shown you in a second. Oh, I can probably do it in here. Um, Let's see if I've got my picture that I want. I have entirely too many pictures. No, that's not the one I want. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't manage to remember all of the pictures that I should show you here. Um, okay, I'm not sure where it is. Oh, I know where it is. It's in, it's in the notes, probably. Probably somewhere. Okay, well, this one will do. I just want to pull up an Apollonian circle packing. Um, yeah, so if you take a look at uh, this example, or maybe this example up here, this one's a good one. Um, do you notice anything about the Apollonian circle packing uh, curvatures? So think about um, mod 3. What do you see mod 3? Yeah, there's only two of the three residue classes represented. Okay. So this is a sort of fundamental observation I had some nice pictures where they're all colored by the residue classes. It's quite pretty, but whatever. Um, so, um, so what you have is, oops. <laughs> what you have is the curvatures of the circles taken mod 24. Oops. Okay, so let's give my packing a name. All right, and then let's take just the collection of curvatures mod 24. Then it turns out that this is one of uh, only a few possibilities. So there we go, that one I remembered. So here we have um, the collection of residues mod 24 that are possible. So there's six possibilities. Four of them have six possible residues, and two of them have eight possible residues. And so this was observed by Graham, Ligarius, Miles, Wilkes, and Jan, and you, you notice it if you look at the packings, like I was pointing out. Like if you start playing with them, you will notice um, this sort of thing happens. And this is called a local obstruction, and it was shown um, by Fuchs that um, it turns out 24, so Fuchs, I'll just say Fuchs said 24. 
24 is all you ever need for this. The instructions can only exist mod 24. There's no other um, moduli that you have to worry about. If you say what they are mod 24, you've captured all the local obstructions. Cool. Yep. Does that mean if you That's just the name for this fact that residue classes are blocked. That's just the word I'm going to use for it. Certain residue classes are missing. And yep. And any other residue condition boils down to one of these. If you, if you write down some residue condition, it might be mod 72, but it would re reduce to something like 24. Right. Yep. So does that mean every number appears? Well, that's the question, right? So is, the, is there a local to global principle, is what a number theorist would say. If you know all the local obstructions, is that enough to know what all of the curvatures are? So, um, so for example, let's go back to a picture of a packing. Um, is it true that everything which is, I forget which thing this is, but is it true that everything in one of those residue classes is appearing? What about even for three, mod three? Do I get everything mod three, which is zero or two? No, because there isn't enough room, right? <laughs> like in this packing, there just isn't room to put a circle of size two. Yeah. So there's some sort of sort of space limitation, right? So we can't expect a full local to global, but you could expect that maybe there's a space limitation for a while, and then there isn't after a while. And so for sufficiently large integers, you would get um, you would get this sort of local to global. Okay. So the, let me, before I state that, let me give you the reason that we have these local obstructions at all, or one way of seeing it. So why is a certain thing mod three ruled out? And um, the reason for that is that you can take the Cayley graph of the, sorry, can take the Cayley graph of the um, Apollonian group, so with the swaps and stuff, right? So you would take like the identity and then the swaps here would take you out to the next elements of the group, and so on and so forth. Okay? And they're not even directed edges because these swaps are order two. Um, so this is a very pretty Cayley graph. It's a tree. But what if I look at it mod eight? Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my quadruple, my starting quadruple, whatever it is, um, at the origin. And then I can see all of the quadruples in the packing by just propagating them out, applying the swap S1, and I get a new quadruple here, and then a new quadruple here. So I can label the Cayley graph with quadruples, and then I can reduce that graph mod some, some thing. This example here is mod eight. And what happens is it becomes a finite graph, just by well, pigeonhole principle or whatever, right? And so now you have a finite graph of the possible quadruples in the packing. And so mod eight, the only things which can occur in this packing here in this example, are these four different quadruples. So in that packing, that infinite packing, if you take any quadruple there, it's going to be one of these four things when you look at it mod 8. And if you don't see all the residues mod 8, then there's no way you can ever see them in the packing. Okay, so there's a sort of simple reason uh, in some sense as to why uh, you would have these sort of local obstructions. And then the conjecture is that this should be everything. But as we saw, there's a sort of um, uh, you know, geometric reason you can't get everything at the beginning, so we should get everything eventually. OK, so this is Fuchs and Sandin. I guess I should write um, the names there. And the statement is that all sufficiently large admissible curvatures appear. OK. Now, this will imply that um, we can give a sort of counting function on curvatures without multiplicity. So if I take all of the integers up to some bound n, and I ask whether or not they appear, I can count how many of them appear. So this is just a yes, no question. Do they appear? I'm not counting with multiplicity. And if this um, local global conjecture is true, then this should be um, some constant times n, where this is just the number of admissible curvatures. So we saw that there were either eight um, or six. 
So you know you have to take out um, you know, um, 18 24ths of the integers off the bat. But of what's left, you should get basically everything, plus O of 1 for some finite correction. So that's what the local global conjecture says. And so this has a long history. So this was first conjectured by Graham, Ligarius, Miles, Wilkes, and Jan in those original papers, like 20 years ago. Um, and in those original papers, they, um, they showed a lower bound of root n, so we're not there yet, right? Sarnak took an interest and showed uh, n over root log n, so this is 2003, I think it was like, maybe it's 2007, but I can't remember. Um, and then Bourguin and Fuchs showed positive density for the first time, which is this statement in 2011. And then Bourguin and Kantorovich showed that we do get, this is the same C, so the correct C, plus an error term which is less, but we don't know exactly how much less, it's just there exists a constant, okay? Yeah? What's greater than, greater than, basically like k in the first greater than n? Like Sorry, greater than, greater than, yeah, what it means is it's greater than a constant times the thing. That's what that notation means, to a number theorist. Yeah, I know it's a, it's maybe a not universal, not universal interpretation. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, this means, so A greater than greater than B means there exists a C such that A is greater than CB, right? And the C could be small. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, and so this was 2014. All right, and then the newest um, is one week ago which is that the conjecture is false. And so this is, um, this came out of an REU um, originally, which I was working on. So this is um, Hug, Kurtzer, Rickards, my postdoc, and myself. And so it can't be overly false, right? Because we, <laughs> we've got these bounds. <laughs> but there's another obstruction going on. So there's something called power obstructions. And to a number theorist, this is quite interesting because um, you know, the, the, one of the normal things that a number theorist will do is take a look at a Diophantine equation, some polynomial equation, and ask if there are solutions to such a thing, um, say maybe over the rational numbers. And then um, in certain special cases, um, it holds a sort of local to global statement, which is that if you have solutions locally, meaning in all of the completions, then you have solutions globally. And this has sort of the same feel but in a lot of these sort of geometric situations, there's something called the Brouwer-Mann obstruction. There's these sort of obstructions that come from reciprocity, and, um, and it doesn't hold. And so this is not a geometric situation because this is a thin group. So it's not an algebraic geometric situation in the same way. But, uh, but then we have these power obstructions and they're coming from reciprocity again. So these are coming from quadratic reciprocity. All right, so if we take P to be a prime, let me see what, how long do I have really here? When did I start? You started at 9 to a so I think you got about five minutes? Okay, five so we'll start, minutes. we'll start. Um, so the idea is, the question is whether or not you're a square mod P, and there's a symbol for this. So if A is a square mod P, then the Legendre symbol is one. Yeah, non-zero square, thank you. And if it's not a square, it's minus one. And if it's zero, it's special, right? We don't want to count that. That's not a good square, okay? And, um, and so this has a nice multiplicativity property because if you multiply a square by a square, it's again a square, and you can um, convince yourself that all of the combinations, in fact, work mod P. And then we can extend the definition to get a multiplicity in the denominator as well. Okay, and so then we have um, 
we have a fairly general symbol which will compare two integers and give you a plus one or a minus one. The zero case is sort of a corner case. I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist really. Okay. Okay. And then the fundamental fact, which is amazing, and has all of you know famously has like gazillions of proofs is that if you ask whether, you take two primes, so p and q, let's say odd primes, and you ask whether p is a square mod q, and you ask whether q is a square mod p, those two things are intimately related, which should be surprising. So whether or not p is a square mod q is easy to determine. There's a fudge factor, just depending on p and q mod 4 from knowing whether q is a square mod p. And so this is kind of a deep fact, which is why there's so many, um, so many proofs of it. And this is actually where the extra obstructions in the, um, in the Apollonian circle packings are coming from. Okay, I guess I can say a couple more words. So the idea of the obstruction, well, I might as well let you still see some things. So remember we had these types back here. So let's do the ones that have six residues. It's just, it's just a little more messy when we have um, more residues than that. Okay. So let's take some circle C, and let's take a tangent circle C prime, and let's say the curvatures are A and B, and let's say that the GCD of A and B uh, are one, so those curvatures are coprime, which is, you know, most of the time maybe. Um, and let's say they're both coprime to six, because these, no, these two and three are somehow special. The 24, you know, is made of twos and threes. Okay, so this is a, sort of a, the most general situation you might find inside your Apollonian circle packing. You have two coprime curvatures that are both coprime to six. Then what you can do is you can define a symbol which will take the value plus or minus one on your circle, and you just do it by the Legendre symbol relationship. And by quadratic reciprocity, it turns out that if you're in one of these six times packings, this um, fudge factor over here, this guy's going to disappear. So it's actually, it doesn't matter if I put A over B or B over A. That's quadratic reciprocity in this case. And what that tells me is that it doesn't matter whether I define this on C or I defined it on C prime. So this is by quadratic reciprocity. And so what quadratic reciprocity gives me is that the symbol actually propagates around the Apollonian circle packing through all the tangencies and becomes a symbol on the packing itself. Yep. So chi 2 of the whole packing is defined. Yep. But I mean, if you take T, why can I take T double prime? Maybe I get the mean of it. If I take T double prime, I'll have to find the T, and then I can see that, by the way, It'll turn out to be the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens is, remember that the curvatures all tangent to C form a quadratic form. They're values of a quadratic form, right? And it turns out that if the, because the discriminant of the form is minus 4n squared, where n is that, oh, sorry, minus 4a squared in this situation. Actually, let me do it, let me do it the upside down way because it's the same, that's what I'm claiming. <laughs> but then we put the curvature on the bottom, so you're looking modulo the curvature of the mother circle. And you look at that form, and because the discriminant is divisible by that, it turns out that they're all squares or they're all not squares. I see the thing that the original factor of the dark point means that this is independent of C prime. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So this is independent of C prime by the quadratic form, yeah. Yeah. And so then it, it turns out that you have actually a plus or minus just assi assigned to your packing. So some packings are plus, some packings are minus. But then if you go back to the definition and see what that means, it means that you can't have a square. Right? If it's minus one, if your packing is a minus one packing, you can't have a square touching any of these circles. Because the, all of the circles in the packing have this property. And so that means you can't get squares at all. And so what happens, I'll just show the table, I guess, before we finish. Um, what happens is we get the following big table of, of occurrences. Sorry. So 
These are the types over here. So the six means six residues, eight means eight residues. The second entry here was just identifying which set of residues. The way we did it is we picked the um, smallest um, co-prime to 24 residue that appears in the list, and that was identifying. And then the, these are the values of the chi-2, and there's also, some of them have a, a fourth entry, which is a chi-4, which is a quartic reciprocity obstruction. But let's just look at the quadratic table. And so, for example, here, if we're in a 6-1 packing, and the symbol is minus 1 for that packing, then we cannot get squares. So the, um, you have the local obstruction of certain things, but then there's just this, these squares that persist forever um, that you can't ever hit. So I should probably just take questions now. Yeah, Thanks. Thank What's your guess in these three unobstructed, in these two un completely unobstructed cases? So our new conjecture, which I didn't have time to write down, but I'll write maybe next time, is that now you take this into account, then there should be finitely many other exceptions. So the, so the original local global conjecture should still hold for those two types where we just didn't happen to have. Yeah. Well, actually, in retrospect, we could have done that. <laughs> so, um, so my postdoc, James Rickards, um, who's, a, who's a programming whiz, he, uh, he programmed the, the computer to be able to compute a huge number of um, uh, curvatures. And so um, if we had just looked at that data and factored the, the later ones, we would have been like, oh, holy crap. But that's not what happened. What happened was um, we decided to do an RU where we were going to look at, okay, when can certain curvatures occur, occur together in a packing? And the, local, the original local global conjecture says that, you know, they should always occur together somewhere, but, um, but maybe they occur together more often or other pairs occur together less often, you know. And so we started doing some data and we discovered that there were some pairs of curvatures which would never occur in the same packing. And that's somewhere in this list here is that, like, if you're of this particular type, then you know you always avoid this, and um, that means that you the conditions mean that you always um, don't avoid this other thing, and vice versa. And so it turned out that there were curvatures which repelled one another. So we discovered this in the most roundabout way possible. <laughs> we were doing graphs of these things, and there were just these persistent pattern of missing curvatures um, in the pairs. And then, of course, we switched gears. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. This guy? This is one example. Yeah, so if you were to do this in general, you'd have like disconnected components, right? And one Apollonian packing, since it's a connected thing, can map to one of those components. So you might have a different residue obstruction mod eight, depending on which quadruple you started with. And that's why we have a list of possibilities and not just only one. Yeah. That's the complete list, yeah. Right, yeah, okay. Well, these are all bounded. So they're all within the bounded category of the other. You mean like a Cayley graph kind of a way? I thought about that, and I don't know. I don't see a way at the moment. But I'm still trying to figure out so I was here at CERN one month ago, and I did not know that the conjecture was false. So, and then we wrote this paper very quickly, and then I came back here one month later. So I would like to understand this better, but I'm, um, I'm still trying to figure out what the best way to think about it is, yeah. The paper is on archive, by the way. Yeah, the paper is on archive, yeah. Yeah, that's why I say one week ago. That was the archive date. What's that? 
Yes, yeah, it's actually, once you realize it's there, the proof is actually very nice. Um, yeah. Thank you.